alive. Coming up, they've been called nine kinds of hell and legal slavery, and they could be coming soon to a roadside near you. In the early 1900s, chain gangs became a regular sight along roadways throughout the South. They were touted as a humane form of punishment. Chain gangs were a reform. Chain gangs were a humanitarian effort to stamp out the convict lease system. But chain gangs had a dark side, corruption and abuses that made them little more than legal slavery. Very few of them lived long enough to serve out their entire sentences. They simply died. In 1932, the public was shocked by the release of a new book, I Am a Fugitive from a Georgia Chain Gang. The bestseller chronicled one man's desperate struggle to escape a hellish world of torture and punishment. If true, how could such a horrific practice exist in 20th century America? Join us for Chain Gang. The prison chain gang, one of the hardest ways for a convict to serve hard time. Reformed out of existence almost 30 years ago, these antiquated prison work crews are making a surprising comeback in 21st century America. Some critics will say it's inhumane to uh, chain prisoners together. I don't know, we chain uh, uh, prisoners together every day with handcuffs. So what's wrong with uh, doing a little work on the streets during the day and being hooked together? Maricopa County Sheriff Joe Arpaio is a big supporter of the chain gang. His Phoenix, Arizona jails now boast two, one for men and one for women. He is ground zero in the national debate over chained prison labor. We oppose chain gangs because we don't think that work should be used as a punishment. Jail is punishment. People are sent to jail as punishment, not for punishment. And I think we need to be doing something much more constructive when they're there. Prison officials and their critics continue to wrestle over the use of chain gangs. Are they humane? What is the best way to punish criminals? These questions have raged for the more than 200 years chain gangs have been in existence in the United States. But are these questions any closer to being answered? 1770, the American colonies. In this world of small, close-knit farming communities, there are no prisons. Since most crimes are committed by local residents, punishments take the form of public whippings and time spent in the stocks, painful tortures intended to shame the offenders in front of their friends and families. The publicness was important for a variety of reasons. Partly it was because these rituals were expected to express the public unity and therefore the community as a whole was supposed to um, participate in them. 18th century governments had to deploy a combination of the terror of these punishments and public opinion as a way of maintaining the legitimacy of the law. With the end of the Revolutionary War in 1783, America becomes a country on the move. Displaced soldiers and recent immigrants flock to urban areas hoping to find a better life, but instead find extreme poverty and hardship. To survive, many resort to petty theft and robbery. The usual public punishments of lashings and the pillory have no effect on this new breed of culprits, and crime continues to grow. In desperation, law enforcement officials institute a new penal system, chain gangs. The first chain gang in the United States came right after the revolution in Philadelphia, not in the South. If you read Jack London's account of being convicted of a petty crime and going to the chain gang to work on the roads, it's in Buffalo, New York, not Macon, Georgia. So there are northern chain gangs. It's not a southern innovation. In Philadelphia, prisoner work crews are often chained to heavy wheelbarrows or cannonballs to prevent their escape. These so-called wheelbarrow men are sent to build and repair roads as a warning to anyone who might consider a life of crime. But the public reaction they elicit turns out to be quite unexpected. 
What happened was the people tended to identify with the wheelbarrow men. They talked with them, they helped them, they gave them charity, they gave them liquor. Legal leaders and legislators began to worry that, in fact, what was happening was that respect for the law was breaking down, and that what was necessary was to separate the condemned from the public more systematically. Chain gangs are abandoned as states began constructing huge, isolated penitentiary buildings to segregate the prisoners from the public. Inside these soaring walls, inmates continue to labor, but now, rather than building roads, they produce prison-made goods like shoes and brooms. These new forms of incarceration were centered around labor within the jail. Often, this was labor that was done for a private contractor, for instance, in Philadelphia in the, what was known as the Walnut Street Jail, which was one of the more important um, early experiments. Uh, workers often sawed stone that were then sold to building contractors. By the mid-1800s, all the northern states have built huge modern prison systems to house their growing convict populations. But the South, oddly, lags far behind. A comparison of the state prison populations of Georgia and Massachusetts in 1850 highlight the widening contrast. While both states have similar numbers of citizens, Massachusetts prisons house 1,236 inmates and Georgia's only 43. Are Georgia citizens more law-abiding than those of Massachusetts? Or does the inequity reflect some deeper, fundamental difference in the way lawbreakers are treated? The answer may lie in the agriculture traditions that continue to rule the South. Huge farms worked by slaves still dominate the Southern landscape. Plantation owners are used to making their own rules and have no need for state institutions. Plantation masters were the law in the antebellum South. If a slave committed a crime, it did not go to local authorities. It was taken care of by the plantation owner himself using essentially his own rules. Even for whites, Southern justice lies outside the courtroom. Punishment for a crime usually is taken care of by the victim or their family and friends. It might involve a duel. Uh, it might involve some sort of physical retaliation. But really, to clear the slate, you and your family had to, outside the law, take essentially justice and vengeance into your own hands. It was really a code of personal honor. It is difficult to imagine a more brutal and violent system of justice, but the unthinkable is about to be unleashed. January 31st, 1865. Congress ratifies the 13th Amendment to the Constitution, officially freeing all slaves. Whites were confronted with the fact that four million people who yesterday had been their property were free people who would enter social life, the labor market, and perhaps even the political process. Emancipation leaves the southern plantation farming system in chaos. Unable to entice or coerce former slaves to stay on, plantation owners turn to the government for help. It comes in the form of a new set of restrictive laws known as the Black Codes. There's no way you can retract the freedom that's been given by the 13th, 14th, and the 15th Amendments, but what you can try to do is to limit it as much as possible, and that's what the Black Codes do. White legislators create scores of new laws aimed solely at blacks that impose long prison sentences for petty larceny, mischief, insulting gestures, cruel treatment of animals, and even intent to steal. Suddenly, freed slaves find that they can be arrested at any time for virtually any reason. The population of southern prisons skyrockets, jumping 72% between 1860 and 1870. But war-torn states possess neither the facilities nor the finances to handle this sudden influx. Many of the prisons that did exist in the South were too small because they had been constructed for that small group of whites prior to the Civil War, and they couldn't handle the new influx of African-American convicts. December 28, 1866. Faced with dangerously overcrowded prisons, the Georgia legislature passes a law to farm out the penitentiary. 
Other southern states quickly follow suit, creating a network known as the convict lease system. They are now legally entitled to chain together their convict populations and lease them out to the highest bidders. The convict lease system was a privatized system of prison labor. When prisoners were convicted in court, they were sent to the penitentiary, but it was a virtual penitentiary. They never entered into a prison. They immediately were slapped in chains and sent, for instance, to the coal mines in northwest Georgia, where they then were imprisoned in a stockade and spent their days working inside the coal mines for a private entrepreneur, not for the state. Numerous former slaves are arrested and find themselves leased back to their previous plantation owners, often working under conditions worse than they had escaped. In many ways, the convict leasing system was in fact worse than slavery. There is some sort of paternal bond that is built up under slavery between the slave owner and the slave. There is none under convict leasing. It is simply a way of working you as hard as you can, and when you die or when you're injured, they simply go back and get another one. Critics question the legality of the brutal new system, but ironically, it is made perfectly valid by the very law that abolishes slavery. The 13th Amendment to the Constitution states that involuntary servitude is illegal in all cases except as a punishment for crime. I think there's a general consensus between Northerners and Southerners that the abolition of slavery should not challenge the emerging penal system of that period, which was highly dependent on using convict labor in the North as well as the South. So there is a certain irony, but an irony that suggests a consensus in matters of punishment at a moment in which slavery was being abolished. Just like slavery, the convict lease system is intended solely for African Americans. Southern white prisoners are spared the indignity of working in chains by a clever legislative loophole. Mississippi passed a law saying that anyone who was sentenced to a, a term of 10 years or more could not go into the lease system, but was so dangerous that he must remain within the walls. Very, very few whites were sentenced to terms of less than 10 years. The reason being that whites only went to prison in the South at this time for the most serious of offenses. Southern state officials love the convict lease system. It allows them to deal with an endless stream of convicts without building new prisons. And it makes them a handsome profit. By the early 1890s, Alabama generates 6 to 10 percent of its yearly state revenues from convict leasing. Prison officials exploit every opportunity in the name of profits. They even collect and sell convicts' urine to tanneries. When a convict dies, their body is marketed to medical schools. The new regimes were fiscally conservative. They felt that the Reconstruction governments had been eager to spend too much money on things like black schools, black education. So fiscal retrenchment meant a desire not to spend much money on things like penitentiaries. Therefore, the privatization of the convict system was appealing because it proved to be a revenue generator for the state rather than a drain. With so much money at stake, the new system becomes rife with abuses. Georgia State Senator Joseph E. Brown awards himself a 20-year lease for 300 convicts to work in his coal mines at the cost of eight cents per inmate per day. Soon, unscrupulous entrepreneurs discover numerous ways to capitalize on the system. You had a man like Jones S. Hamilton, who through bribery and other means, won the right to lease all convicts in the state of Mississippi. What Hamilton did was to pay the state about a dollar a month to rent every convict in the state. He then would sublease these convicts to plantation owners, railroad owners, factory owners for nine dollars a month. So if you're talking about thousands of convicts, Hamilton is making eight dollars a month on every convict he rents. By 1877, 
the convict lease has become such a profitable enterprise that the Florida legislature abolishes its state penitentiary and leases out all the prisoners. There is little need for prison buildings in the post-war South. By 1877, the convict lease system has effectively replaced prisons in the South. In the North, though, correctional facilities have all but abandoned their use of prison labor. Prison labor, um, for a variety of reasons, some having to do with trade union opposition, others having to do with the um, deterioration of authority structures, others having to do with inmate resistance, um, simply were not as economically central as convict labor turned out to be. In the South, the incredible profits generated by the convict lease system quickly undermine any pretense of rehabilitation. With no way to oversee the lease camps, prison officials basically cede all responsibility to the lessees. A report on the Alabama penal system notes that many convicts disappeared as completely as if the earth had opened up and swallowed them. The convict lease system was not surprisingly susceptible to all sorts of abuses because the interest of the people who were controlling and overseeing the convicts, housing them, feeding them, benefiting from their labor, was to save as much money as possible. Whether leased to work on railroads, mines, or plantations, the conditions are uniformly miserable. Convicts are housed in ramshackle shacks or transported to the worksite in rolling cages like those used for circus animals. Often the prisoners are chained together 24 hours a day, even while in bed. They work 14 hours a day, often seven days a week, under the constant gaze of sadistic and untrained guards with little food and inadequate sanitation. What convicts were known for doing was the kind of work that Mississippi plantation owners, railroad owners, factory owners could not get free labor to do. So if you had to clear a malarial swamp, you could not get free labor to do it, but you could get convicts to do it because they had no choice. They would be chained together, working up to their waists in all kinds of brackish water for hour upon hour, actually having to relieve themselves in that water and then drink it because that was their drinking supply. It was an incredibly brutal system. The seriousness of the crime has little to do with the punishment. Ridiculously long sentences are meted out for even minor offenses without regard to age or sex. Often petty criminals are sent to the worst places. The wildcat camps were county convict camps that were invisible to the state. There was no control over them whatsoever. And the irony of it was that these were people who were prosecuted and convicted of very small, minor offenses, and yet doing time in a wildcat camp was probably the worst place to be. There is no relief for prisoners in the stinking, squalid convict lease camps. Those who cannot maintain the relentless work pace are whipped or subjected to other cruel tortures. One convict writes simply, this place is nine kinds of hell. There is not a single instance in the history of Mississippi in which a least convict lived through a sentence of 10 years or more. The death rate among least convicts skyrockets to appalling levels. Southern prisons report an average death rate that is nearly three times greater than in northern penitentiaries. Gunshots, malnutrition, heat stroke, and shackle poisoning caused by the chains around their ankles all take a toll on the convict population. There really were three ways out of a convict camp. The first way to was, was to escape, which was very, very difficult. The second way was self-mutilation, which was known as knocking a Joe, and it was simply taking a limb off. You might take off several toes, take off your arm from your wrist down. And it was a way of depriving the lessee of your labor. The third way out was simply to die. Despite some public opposition, the convict lease system gains popularity across the South. 
Critics begin to wonder if there is anything that can be done to stop the brutality. Legally, these camps did have to be inspected on an annual basis. The way that worked was everyone knew when they were coming. The lessees spent a day cleaning up the camp, getting their convicts dressed nicely, and putting on a nice Potemkin Village show about what the convict camp looked like. What you have to remember, and what is so important, is that you're talking about a black convict population, and you're talking about the dregs of a supposedly inferior race. These are people who have very little sympathy among those who count in society. The wealthy politicians and businessmen who do count find that the convict lease system has an unplanned bonus. It is a powerful weapon against organized labor. The convict leasees are quite explicit about wanting to use convict labor precisely to drive down wages, to guarantee that trade unions among the mine workers won't form, or that if they do and go on strike, there'll be a scab replacement force readily available to put in the mines. For years, chained convicts are successfully used as a pawn in the battle against organized labor. Then, in 1892, the practice is finally challenged by a group of militant Tennessee coal miners. Miners armed themselves and fought the state militia in order to destroy these, these convict camps. They burned down the prison stockades, removed the convicts from the mines, placed them on a train, and sent them to the state capital, saying that convicts should not be worked in competition with free labor. Bowing to union pressure and penal reform critics, Tennessee outlaws convict leasing in 1896. Other states soon follow ending a system that has existed for 30 years. Now saddled with huge numbers of prisoners and no place to house them, state prison officials look to several more humane alternatives. In places like Mississippi or Texas, the solution was a prison farm that would grow cotton and produce a lot of revenue for the states. In the southeast, in places like Georgia, North Carolina, South Carolina, the solution was the chain gang. By the turn of the 20th century, most southern states abandoned the convict lease system in favor of supposedly more humane alternatives. Several states, like Mississippi, opened giant agricultural farms that serve as their prisons. Parchment Farm comes into being at the turn of the 20th century, and it is seen as a humane alternative to convict leasing, but parchment is an antebellum cotton plantation. It is there simply to make money for the state of Mississippi by using black convicts to grow cotton. Most southern states, though, turn to county chain gangs as the alternative to the convict lease system. The people who advocated the chain gang argued that it would build good roads, and that it would take the financial interest in working convicts hard, punishing them and treating them badly out of the hands of private entrepreneurs and into the hands of the state. As one of its advocates said, and the state has always been a kind master to its slaves. This was seen as a humane alternative to the privatized system of convict leasing. To the convicts, though, the humanity is not apparent. They still have shackles permanently attached to their ankles and work under the watch of armed guards. When sent out to work, lines of prisoners continue to be chained together, making it difficult to walk and even harder to escape. Chain gang movements are synchronized by the use of prison chants, which set the pace of work. These mournful songs, progenitors of the modern blues, are the secret languages of prison work crews through which convicts communicate complaints and hope. The prison work songs were absolutely essential to prisoner morale. Indeed, I think it would have been hard for them to work that long without some sort of diversion. Now this had been done in West Africa, these work songs, they had been done in the American slave south, and they really have kept this tradition alive through the Delta Blues. 
One of the most legendary chain gang singers is Huddy Ledbetter, better known as Leadbelly. While jailed in Texas, Leadbelly uses his masterful guitar playing and booming voice to appeal for mercy from Governor Pat Neff. He succeeds in getting a release. Jailed again nine years later, this time in Louisiana, Leadbelly sings an entreaty to Governor O.K. Allen. I believe Governor O.K. Allen, if you just sent him a record of that song, I believe he'd tune me loose. Fine, Leadbelly. Remarkably, You're this second song. governor is equally moved by the singer's mournful plea and also lets him out of prison. By the end of 1909, the Georgia State Prison Committee proudly reports that the convicts have graded and made permanent 6,000 miles of road. Bad boys make good roads becomes a popular slogan in the state. So the chain gang was an excellent reform as it was presented, particularly spearheaded by something called the Good Roads Movement which was this civic organization that spread all across the South that was interested in improving Southern roads. Most Southerners come to view the chain gangs as a quaint, genteel institution, a view that is further demonstrated by the addition of white convicts to their ranks. Chain gangs become the first integrated institution in the segregated South. Once the chain gang as a reform was instituted after 1908, there's more of a willingness to send whites into the prison system than there had been before. And so the chain gang, the convict system, by 1925 or so, had gone from being 10% white, 90% black, to about 25% white, 75% black. Still extreme racial disparity in convictions, yet more and more whites are being sent into the prison system. By 1923, every state of the Union, except for Rhode Island, has chain gangs. State officials throughout the country proudly point to them as signs of development and prosperity. Then, in 1932, a bombshell is dropped on the unknowing public. The publication of the potboiler, I Am a Fugitive from a Georgia Chain Gang, written by ex-convict Robert Burns. Burns was a World War I veteran who became a hobo in 1920, 1921, was traveling around the country, found himself in Georgia, claimed he was tricked into helping with a robbery, and found himself caught up in the convict system of Georgia and convicted to a chain gang for five years. The conditions that Burns encounters are every bit as barbarous as the worst of the convict leasing system. He rages. That is what a chain gang is for. Torture. Torture every day. Any idea of reformation, any idea of trying to inoculate ideas of, of decency, manners, or good and right thinking in the convict is prohibited. All the convicts get is abuse, curses, punishment, filth. In a few weeks, all are reduced to the same level, just animals, and treated worse than animals. Brutalized for six months by savage guards and relentless labor, Burns escapes from the chain gang on June 21, 1922. For seven years, he successfully works under an assumed name as a magazine publisher in Chicago before the long arm of Georgia justice catches him once again. After 12 brutal months back on the chain gang, Burns escapes a second time. The fugitive heads to New Jersey, where his mother and brother live. He once more creates a new identity and lives as a model citizen. But the threat of recapture is never far behind. While Georgia may say that I escaped from justice, I emphatically state that I escaped from injustice, intolerance, and the vengeance of a society that is a hundred years behind the times. It's now my life's ambition to destroy the chain gang system in Georgia. While in hiding, he writes this popular serialized version of his experiences and his escape from the Georgia chain gang, in part to publicize his own case and to win his freedom. And so he was a popularizer, not really a reformer. He was trying to popularize his own case. 
This becomes an immediate hit and is then picked up by Hollywood and turned into this film. This was the most sensational escape in chain gang history. Only months after I Am a Fugitive from a Georgia Chain Gang hits the bookstores, the film version takes the country by storm. The movie is a huge success, even garnering three Academy Award nominations, including one for Best Picture. Not surprisingly, the state of Georgia resents Burns' accusations. If there is any prison reform necessary in the Empire State of the South, then those of us who have been elected to do it will do it and not a fugitive from justice. The state goes so far as to sue Burns for slander, but an independent investigation proves his claims. One of the many revelations contained in the report is that of the 4,000 men sentenced to Georgia chain gangs between 1929 and 1930, nearly 100 died, 524 escaped, and 1,490 bribed their way out. For Burns, and I think for the public at large, this is more a study of or an account of bureaucratic corruption, ineptitude, and backwardness than it was of penal cruelty, and certainly more a story about that than it was about racial cruelty and racial control. That really wasn't part of his story at all. December 14, 1932. After nearly two years of working and living under an assumed name in New Jersey, Robert Burns is once more discovered by Georgia officials. Public reaction is swift and vocal. Thousands of letters flood the office of New Jersey Governor A. Harry Moore, urging him to refuse to extradite Burns. Over 1,000 spectators packed the Trenton, New Jersey Assembly Chamber for the emotional extradition hearing. The raucous crowd grows louder with each testimony and nearly explodes when a final secret witness is announced. Robert Burns watches in amazement as the Atlanta grocer he helped to rob takes the stand and recommends that he be released. In the face of such overwhelming evidence, Governor Moore refuses to give the prisoner back to Georgia. Burns is free, if only within his home state of New Jersey. I'm happy to be free. I thank the governor from the bottom of my heart, and I promise him and the people of the state of New Jersey and the people of the United States that I will live as a good citizen for the remainder of my life. Still, despite the criticism, Georgia doggedly continues to defend its use of convict labor. But the end of chain gangs is near. In the middle of the Great Depression, local counties simply don't even have the cash to operate, to feed their convicts, to pay the convict guards. Once the New Deal comes in, federal aid had a rider explicitly saying no convict labor may be used on this project. You must put free work to labor on these roads. You must not use convict labor. And I think that had a great deal to do with the economic demise of the chain gang. With the election of reformer Ellis Arnall as governor of Georgia in 1943, chain gang reform is finally formalized. Arnall signs legislation that makes Georgia the first state to outlaw corporal punishment and the use of shackles, manacles, picks, leg irons, and chains on its chain gangs. In November 1945, Governor Arnall personally represents fugitive Robert Burns before the Georgia Board of Pardons and Parole. After 23 years on the run, Burns finally has his sentence commuted, making him a truly free man. For a quarter of a century, I've been a fugitive from the Georgia chain gang. Today, I am a free man. Today, the chain gangs have become abolished. Despite the reforms made in Georgia, chain gangs and prison work farms continue to linger in many southern states for 20 more years. As late as the 1960s, prison road crews can still be found along southern highways. Southern prisons don't really achieve any genuine reform in their conditions until the 1960s with the Civil Rights Movement. And it would be a mistake to point to Burns or Ellis Arnold as the key reformers of southern prisons. Really, it was the Civil Rights Movement of the 1960s that brought to light the horrendous conditions 
for black prisoners in particular in the southern states and forced a change. The national spotlight finally illuminates brutal southern prison practices in 1961. In an attempt to blunt the growing civil rights movement, Mississippi Governor Ross Barnett jails a group of young northern protesters known as the Freedom Riders in the Parchman Work Farm. But the scare tactic backfires. Rather than being deterred, the appalled protesters tell the media about their experiences. And once that happened, there was a huge outcry that reform must take place. The state of Mississippi was unwilling to do it, but federal courts were not. By the end of the 1960s, federal civil rights laws forced most states to discontinue the use of chained prison labor. But the victory will not be permanent. 1995. Despite their horrible reputation, chain gangs once more return to the headlines. Alabama's Limestone Correctional Facility places chains on 400 inmates and puts them to work on the state's roads. Once more, legislators are turning to chain gangs as a means to combat overcrowded and underfinanced prisons. I think politicians want to show the public that they are tough on crime, and there's no better way than to put the prisoners on public display to have them in jumpsuits, chained together near a public highway with thousands of people driving by. Today, several states and counties use chain gang labor, but none more enthusiastically than Sheriff Joe Arpaio of Maricopa County, Arizona. The man who introduced such innovations as a tent city jail and no television for prisoners sees chain gangs as a valuable deterrent. I put the chain gang right smack in downtown. I want everybody uh, to see the chain gang because I want the mother to drive by. I want them to say to the daughter, see, honey, you do something wrong, you're going to be working that chain gang. And the mothers uh, on that chain gang, you know what they say? Yes, thank you for giving me that opportunity because we may save our daughter one day. Arpaio's chain gangs are purely voluntary, although completing a 30-day stint on the work crew is the only way for inmates to recover lost privileges. God of Abraham and of Moses. Prisoners work chained together, but the only punishments meted out in these pseudo-military chain gangs are push-ups. The term chain gang may have a special connotation, but so what? I, in fact, I hope that they uh, look at the word chain gang as very, very bad, awful, not brutal, not inhumane, maybe embarrassing. Okay, hey, so if you don't want to be embarrassed, don't commit a crime and don't, don't go to jail and be convicted. Sheriff Arpaio's chain gangs have earned some surprising fans, inmates, who find that their time in the program has a positive effect. Some of my fellow inmates might not like it, but I think that everybody should have a chance to be on the chain gang. Being in here isolated, it becomes a world is to itself and you don't get to appreciate the difference. But going out there every day, seeing people going to work, seeing people just living life free, it's put smack in front of your face that you have a choice of how you want to live. Maricopa County prisoners work six days a week performing community services. Sheriff Arpaio estimates that work done by his chain gangs has saved the county over $500,000 in the first three years of the program. But not everyone agrees with his numbers. I think the perception that chain gangs, the use of chain gangs saves money is a perception held by Joe Arpaio. I think anyone who looks at it from an objective standpoint, including any other sheriff in any other jurisdiction, will see there's no, absolutely no ju justification that chain gangs save money under any circumstance. After more than 200 years of experimentation, prison officials are still uncertain as to the best way to punish criminals. Rather than trying to construct in some abstract way a perfect model, it would be worth comparing where we seem to be today 
with the moment of the birth of the prison in the late 18th century. Because one of the things that is clear is that they thought about punishment in terms not only of what they thought of as justice in the law, but in terms of what they believed a just society should be. Today, those questions are too often separated. And the question of justice in a broader sense gets subordinated to the question of justice in the narrow sense. Despite the controversy, Sheriff Arpaio shows no signs of backing down. In fact, he plans to expand his use of chain gangs. I'm looking towards being the first person in the world to put juveniles on a chain gang, because I now have a juvenile tent city. And when they violate our policies, they go into lockdown. Should I give them an opportunity to volunteer to join the chain gang so they can work themselves out of the lockdown back into the tents? That may be coming at a neighborhood near you it is the first juvenile chain gang. Queen Anne's County in Maryland recently considered using stun belts rather than chains on its road crews. Other states have been experimenting with putting chain convicts to work singly instead of attached in groups. With prison populations continuing to grow at historic rates, states are exploring different kinds of incarceration and punishment, even updated forms of chain gangs. To discover more about this and any other topic, please use our search engine at historychannel.com.